So good afternoon. This is my last session of the event. Might not be your last session. Maybe you're going to the next time slot as well. This session is about demoing all of the assessment and deployment kit tools. And there are quite a few of them. Basically, there are 17 different tools included in this one kit. We're going to try to walk through just about all of them. We'll see how many we can get through in the time that we have allotted. Just for some general background, the assessment and deployment kit is the latest version of what used to be called the Windows Automated Installation Kit. It was released initially to support Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012. The new Windows 8.1 preview version came out this week, so there is an updated version. Fortunately, that doesn't add any new tools, although we'll see in a few cases where there are some tweaks to the existing tools. There are a, a new set of assessment tools that are included in this ADK that came out with Windows 8, which is where it got the assessment part of the, the kit name. So it's intended for use, use for deployment purposes. So most enterprises, most organizations would use the deployment tool pieces. The assessment tools are in a lot of ways more focused on OEMs, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful for others as well. The installation process for the ADK is basically to download a, a bootstrap file. One of the big complaints with the Windows AIK was you downloaded a very large ISO. Then you had to figure out how to get the content out of that ISO so you could actually run the installation. So they changed that to just an executable. When you run the executable, it then goes out to the download center and downloads the specific components that you selected. So if you just choose one or two components, the install is fairly small, fairly quick. Unfortunately, the one that most people install is Windows PE. Windows PE was the bulk of that size. So as soon as you check Windows PE as a component to install, you're still going to have a, a few hundred meg to download to install as part of the, the ADK kit. There are x86 and x64 components included in the assessment and deployment kit. There aren't any ARM components, though. So if you think you can use the ADK to create custom images or to maintain Windows on ARM or Windows RT, uh, you can't. Those tools aren't available as part of the ADK. That's OK. ADK is really, or uh, Windows RT is really intended to come pre-configured on the devices anyway, so uh, shouldn't be an issue. The ADK can be installed on Windows 7 and above. That continues to be true with the Windows 8.1 version of it. So as long as you have a single machine running Windows 7 or higher, you can install the uh, ADK and make use of all the tools. The installation process, basically you run the setup program. And you can choose one of two things. You can say that you want to install it on the current machine, or you can specify that you just want to download all the pieces. The reason you may want to download all the pieces is so that you can then take the resulting folder, copy it into a, a machine that doesn't have an internet connection, and then install the ADK on that computer. The components that you can choose there are a few of them listed. That list is actually slightly different if you're installing on a server versus a client. In this case, you'll see Windows Assessment Services client on a client operating system. But if you did the same thing on a server OS, that one would disappear. Otherwise, the list is the same. So the tools that we want to walk through are basically listed here with the, the major categories, in some cases, having uh, several different individual tools underneath them. So we've got the App Compat Toolkit and a few tools that come with that. The core deployment tools, which are mostly a set of command line tools, except for the Windows System Image Manager. The User State Migration Tool, which includes tools to capture, restore uh, user state, as well as a utility executable. Volume Activation Management Tool, Windows PE, Windows Performance Toolkit, and then the assessment pieces. So that's what we want to go through. We want to walk through each of those. And at that point, that finishes the PowerPoint slides. Because to go through 17 demos, we don't have time to jump back and forth between PowerPoint and demo machine for each of those. But uh, I do need a little bit of something for my own purposes 
just so that I can remember which tool am I showing right now. So we've got a mini PowerPoint on the side where we'll look through each of the tools. So let's start off with the AppCompat Toolkit. The AppCompat Toolkit is designed to help do a few things. The first part is to gather inventory about your environment. So it includes the Application Compatibility Manager. That's this tool. This tool, when you install it, creates a database. That database is used to store inventory collected from client machines. In order for it to do that, it runs a collector on the client machines and it writes the inventory that was gathered to a file share. So the first time you run this, it'll ask you to create a database and to create a file share. That file share gets shared out. You have to make sure that the security on that share allows whoever's running these collector packages to be able to write basically a cab file into that folder. And then this will install a service that runs on the machine that reads those, that puts the data into the database. Fairly easy to set up, fairly lightweight. It's fairly scalable because what's really happening on the client side is just running an inventory process and then dropping a file into a file share. So a lot of people say, well, can I put this on a server? Yeah. Can I put it on a workstation? Yeah. It's really just a question of how many of these inventory files are you going to write and how long are you willing to wait for them to all be processed? So let's say you decide, well, I'm going to put ACT on a, I'm going to put this service on a desktop machine in my office. And it's not a very big desktop. I can install SQL on it. I can install the uh, app compat log processing service on it. And all of those log files will get written into the folder. The service might fall behind. I mean, there could be files coming in faster than it can process them. That's okay, as long as you don't run out of disk space on the machine, the servers will eventually get through all of them and put all of the data into the database. So it's really more of a question of how many log files do you want to process? Each one will take somewhere between five and 20 seconds, depending on the machine, for this service to process them. You can run these uh, inventories multiple times. ACT is smart enough to handle the delta between them. So if it sees any changes on a computer, it can fix up the inventory appropriately. So once you've got the database and once you have the log processing service running, the next step is to collect inventory. And you do that by creating a collection package. These data collection packages are bundled as an MSI. So here I can say that I want to, now let me just go ahead and delete the one that I had before. I can double click to add a new data collection package for inventory collection. I can give it a name. I can specify what share should be used to write the resulting inventory. And if I wanted to, I could put a label on it just to show that the inventories collected by this particular package have this label. When I say create, it'll ask me to save the resulting MSI file. So maybe I want to just drop that into my documents folder. And I'm done. Now you could take that MSI and deploy it in a few different ways. The easiest would be group policy. You can use the application assignment process, uh, steps in group policy to publish that out to existing machines. You could also use a startup script, configuration manager, Intune, anything else that's able to install an MSI. Now when you install it, it doesn't really do anything to the system other than collect inventory. So it's basically packaged as an MSI more for convenience than because it's actually installing something. So I can go ahead and run it on the server here and we see it run through and then it just kind of vanishes. So now there is a process running in the background collecting the inventory. 
when it's done, it will write to that file share and then the log processing service will pick it up. So we can see right now it's processed four logs in the background. Uh, if we refresh that after a period of time, we'll probably see that go to five. Uh, it may take a couple of minutes before that actually happens. So once that inventory has been collected, we can go back to the Analyze tab and we can see all of the details that were collected from the machine. So basically it's gathering a full list of the apps that are installed on each computer as well as a list of all the devices on the computer where devices are any plug and play device that needs a driver. And we can use that information to then talk to the back end Microsoft App Compat database, which is running in the cloud, and pull down compatibility information about the drivers and about the apps. To do that, we just click to send and receive. That will tell you here's the information that we're going to send through, all of the apps, any assessments that we put to say this app works or it doesn't, our IP address because, well, there's no way of avoiding that, the list of devices or things that need drivers that have been inventoried, and some basic usage data on the application. If you really want to, you can browse through it as XML and it'll show you exactly what's being sent. But when we click send, it uploads and then downloads the matching data from the database. Depending on how many computers you have here, this could take a while the first time, but it will get faster over time because it has less information to exchange. So from there, this is the new version for the Windows 8.1 preview, so we can see details on Windows 8.1, Windows 8, or Windows 7. When we look at applications, we can see each app in our environment, the vendor assessment to indicate whether it's compatible or not, if there were any community assessments to say from the community, yes, we've tested this application, we think it's okay, or your own user assessments uh, to indicate whether you think the app actually works. So what you would do is you would collect all this information, you get the information back from Microsoft, that kind of gives you a starting point of the apps that you think are going to be okay and then you can focus your testing on the ones where you have more doubts. So ideally, you would go through this list of applications and do some categorization to indicate which of these are more critical and which aren't. So we could uh, put in additional category details for that application, assign categories. Right now, there's a, a test complexity one. That's not quite what we want. Maybe we want to add our Contoso category and then say mission critical, business critical, critical, important, trivial, something like that, just to indicate the importance of the application. We can then tag each of the applications. So if it's a business critical application, that's probably something we want to test regardless of what the inventory has shown us from the back end service. If it's mission critical, no question, we're going to test it regardless of what anyone else thinks. But if it's only important or trivial, maybe we don't do any testing of it at all, especially if the compatibility detail that comes back says green, that we've had the vendor, the Microsoft, and the community saying this application works. That's probably good enough. We don't need to do any additional testing on that application. So once we've applied those categories, then we can run reports and use that to filter the list and then focus our attention on just those lists of applications. So this is kind of that first phase of trying to go through the list of applications to figure out what do we have, then to categorize it to figure out what's most important that we want to spend our time testing, and then to record the results of that testing to indicate do we think this app is compatible or not. In this case, I know that Microsoft Deployment Toolkit is compatible, so I could mark it as 
ready to deploy. If I don't have any issues re recorded, I can basically say that it works. So that's your own assessment of that. The next time I synchronize with Microsoft, it would actually send that d data, data back to the online service for other people to be able to see the count of, of, uh, of assessments that have been done by others. So easy enough. That's basically the purpose of the application compatibility man manager. The next piece that's in there is a slightly different component the compatibility administrator, which I'm not sure I have running at the moment, is designed to fix issues. So as new versions of Windows come out, existing applications that worked on older versions may run into issues caused by changes in Windows, especially if the applications didn't follow best uh, practices for development. So there may be a need to apply fixes to those applications. Those fixes are done through shims. Shims are basically small pieces of code that sit between the application and Windows and alter the behavior of the application to make it work. So there are a bunch of fixes built into Windows. If we look at the full list, there are 404 compatibility fixes included in Windows by default. So any of those 404 can be applied to any application to say alter its behavior. Windows comes pre-configured with a bunch of those already applied. So if we expand out the system database and list all the applications, we'll see every shim that's applied to Windows by default. That list takes a bit to expand because there are a lot of them. And they go back for, in some cases, decades. Apps that you probably haven't seen for ages, there are still shims in place for those. Like when's the last time you played a $100,000 pyramid on your Windows machine? But we have a shim in place for that that applies a compatibility fix called Game UX anytime it sees an app with pyramid.exe and a few other data files on your system. Grand total, 7,093 of these are included in server 2012 R2. So we've gone through and tested all of those applications, determined what fixes were necessary for them, and built them into Windows. We're always updating this list. Every month, there could be additional entries added to this list as we find issues and uh, develop the shims to put on those. So that's happening behind the scenes, but you can also make use of that for your own applications or any app issues that you run into by creating your own custom database. So I can create a new application fix, and as part of that application fix, say, here are the shims that I want to apply to a particular application. Now, the app that we normally use for doing demos, if I try to run it on server 2012 R2, works just fine. It comes up with no issues. It's not supposed to work just fine. It's supposed to fail. So there's a change that happened in R2. We haven't quite figured out what that one is. So for the moment, I'm going to switch back over to my server 2008 R2 server sorry, my server two, yeah, server 2008 R2. No, it is server 2012. Never mind, ignore me. And I'm going to run the application there just to show you what it's supposed to do. If I run Stock Viewer, it's one of these apps that was written to assume that it would always be running with admin rights. So if you try to run it on a machine where it doesn't have admin rights, first thing it does is put up an error message to say, you need to run this as administrator. So then the question becomes, well, how do you fix that? So we can close the application. We can start up the compatibility administrator. It is a 32-bit application, so we want the 32-bit version of that. We can create a new application fix. 
for stock viewer, browse to the location of the executable, see program files, stock viewer. We could apply compatibility modes, which are really just groupings of existing fixes that have been put together. In this case, I'll select an individual fix. I need to find a fix that basically causes Windows to lie to the application. So if the application asks, do you have administrative rights, it always says yes. That's basically what the shim does. Regardless of whether it's true or not, let's tell the application that yes, indeed, you're running with administrative rights. Now, in this case, I know the name of the shim. It's called force admin access. So I know what to select to fix that problem. That becomes one of the, the biggest challenges is of those 400 or so shims that are available, which one will fix the particular problem that I'm trying to solve with this application? Maybe I have an application that was written when Windows was installed in WinNT and I need to fix it so that it works with Windows. Maybe I have an application that's hard coded for C colon documents and settings username, and now it's C colon backslash users. All of those can be fixed by using the appropriate shim. In this case, I'll just do force admin access, click on finish, save that database. Let's do tech ed. Europe. Saves as an SDB file. And then I can right click and say to install that. The installation process is basically just running SDB inst and then the name of the SDB file. So if that's now been installed. We can see it now listed as an installed database on this computer. And now when we run that application, we shouldn't get any errors anymore. So now the application comes up without that error dialog. So that's the simple example of applying a shim to an application to solve a problem. There is another tool included in the App Compat Toolkit called the Standard User Analyzer, which can be used to try to help and figure out what particular shims are needed for an application, but it's not the most reliable tool in the world. So if we go back into here, say to uninstall that shim so that we're again running without admin rights, then we can run another tool called SUA. That tool allows us to say we want to run this executable, stockviewer.exe. We don't want to elevate it and go ahead and launch it and watch what it's doing. So the application runs, it gets the error, it comes up. There are some other things that when you click on them, it generates some errors to try to do some things that it's not actually allowed to do. So you run through whatever operations aren't working, then exit out, it analyzes the results and then can recommend the shims that should be applied. So if we say to apply mitigations, it will say that it's detected the need to use a local mapped object shim to alter the behavior of the application. Notice though that it didn't come up with one saying to force admin access. It should have, but based on the operations that I performed and what it was seeing, it couldn't detect that need. So your results may be uh, less than perfect using this tool. That's why there is another tool out there released by an MCS developer, Aaron Margosis, who was actually here this week called Lua Bug Light, which takes an alternative approach to monitoring the applications to basically come up with the same information, but doing it in a different way. The way Lua Bug Light would do it is it allows the application to issue an API call running with low writes. And then if it sees that that API fails, it repeats the API call 
elevated and then sees if it succeeds. It can tell based on that scenario, is this a problem that needs to be shimmed or not? So that can be helpful for troubleshooting these problems. So then we get into deployment tools. And the first deployment tool is BCD Boot. BCD Boot is a utility for creating new boot entries in the BCD. It's named pretty well. Basically, you would use it if you wanted to set up a new operating system on a computer. That's probably not something you do by hand yourself. It's something that a deployment tool does for you. MDT, Config Manager, WDS, whatever you're using, effectively use this behind the scenes. But there's no reason we couldn't use it ourselves. And a typical scenario that people would want to use this themselves for is boot from BHD. You can set up a machine to be running multiple operating systems, each one in a VHD file, and be able to boot between them with multiple BCD entries. You could use BCD Edit to create line by line the necessary BCD entry for a new OS, but that would be like 15 different BCD Edit commands, and it's kind of tedious. BCD Boot takes care of all that for you. So if I run BCD Boot, then the path for Windows that I want to add, then I can say slash D so that I don't make it the default. It will create a new BCD entry. Now in this case, V, the drive letter V, is a mounted VHD. So it creates a BCD entry to do boot from, B, boot from VHD. So now if I do BCD edit slash enum, we can see the original OS BCD down here, but we can also see the new one here that points to whatever was in the V drive, which just so happens to be a Windows PE image. So it set up the entries to, to do that. So easy enough to do, but that doesn't mean that it always creates the right BCD entry. In this case, it's created an entry that says boot from partition V, but V is a mounted VHD, so that won't actually work. If I were to actually would reboot the machine and try to boot from that one, it's not going to be, it's not going to have the desired result. So I really need to modify it to specify the correct device and OS device entry to point it to the VHD file. So it may not do 100% of the work, but it at least gets to the point where we can do the rest of it with a couple of simple commands. So first I need the GUID of the entry that I want to modify, which is most easily done using copy and paste, but I can say set that GUID, OS device, VHD equal bracket C colon bracket colon, uh, sorry, C colon backslash, I got a brace there, backslash temp, uh, what's the name of my VHD? PE.VHD. So that sets the one place and then there's a second location for that which also needs to be changed. And now if we do the enum, it shows a correct entry for that, assuming I got the syntax right, which apparently I didn't because it didn't change. The joys of using a beta operating system. It says it's completed successfully, but it's not showing the change. In any case, that's what's supposed to happen. When I did this earlier, it actually created the correct entries for a VHD file. When I did it the second time, it created the incorrect entries. When I did it the third time, now it's not changing them at all. So eh, some little flakiness around, but if you do the same thing on server 2008 R2, it, uh, it works as expected. 
So BCD boot creates the new BCD entry. BCD edit can be used to modify those entries. I should probably clean up the one that I just created just to make sure that I don't forget about it, reboot my machine and find myself in Windows PE. So I can say to delete that entry. That one should actually work. So now if I do the enum, we see that entry is gone. If you have multiple BCD entries and you wanted to choose between them, the default boot timeout is zero seconds, which basically never gives you a, a uh, chance to make a selection. But we can change the timeout using BCD edit. We could say give us a 30 second timeout instead of a zero second timeout so that we could then choose between any entries that we wanted. So that's BCD boot and BCD edit. Hopefully you don't need to use either of these very often. There could be some scenarios like the VHD scenario that we talked about. There's also a utility called boot sect. This is one that I hope you never have to use. It's used to update the boot sector on an existing disk. So when you're doing an OS deployment, generally this is done for you by the fact that you run a disk part clean command. When you run disk part clean, it always puts in a, a Windows Vista or an NT60 boot sector. This command is only really needed in cases where the machine doesn't already have the right boot sector on it. So imagine you have a machine running Windows XP. Windows XP uses an NT52 boot sector. When you put Windows 7 on it, you need an NT60 boot sector. So you had to run boot sec to change the boot sector from an XP boot sector to a Windows 7 boot sector. All right, well, what's the difference in these boot sectors? NT52 looks for a file named NTLDR. That's the old NT loader that reads in the boot.ini and does the boot process. On Vista and above, that's changed, so it's now boot MGR. So the NT60 boot sector looks for boot MGR, and then if it doesn't find it, it actually falls back to using uh, the old one, whereas the, the new boot sector, or sorry, the old boot sector only looks for the NT LDR. So that's. One of those that if you don't have any more XP around and everything is Vista and above in your environment, you'll never have to worry about this again. The boot sector for uh, NT60 is compatible with all the newer operating systems. If I wanted to run that, it's easy enough. I can run boot sect slash NT60 all and tell it to update all the volumes on all of my disks to put in the, the updated boot code. It'll successfully do that. It won't necessarily be able to lock the drives to make that happen until the next reboot, but that's not a problem. It will uh, take effect for the next reboot when the system comes back up. So not too exciting there. The next tool in the list is DISM. This one could easily be a session on its own because DISM has lots of options. So if we expand this out some and run DISM slash question mark, we see all of the command line options that are applicable in DISM. Actually, we see the start of all of the command line options. We don't see all of them because there are sub options for each of those options, so it just keeps growing out. We could probably spend an hour just going through the help screens on DISM and looking at all the options. But the types of things that you can do with it are operating system servicing, so we can use it to uh, create WIMS, to mount WIMS, to create VHDs, mount VHDs, look at the images in existing WIM files. We can use it for servicing of offline images or online operating systems. We can use it to set international options. So we get lots of options, which you can see more when you say, well, what can I do to an online operating system? Then it starts listing out the package servicing commands. So we could use it to add additional updates into the OS. We have application servicing commands to apply 
uh, MSPs. International s uh, servicing commands to change, say, the UI language or time zone or anything like that. We can inject or update drivers. We can uh, add new Windows Store apps. We can change the file associations for applications. And we can even change the addition of Windows for some scenarios. Let's say you have a machine that's running Windows 8 and you want it to become Windows 8 Pro. There's a single command you can run with DISM that changes one to the other. All you need to do is give it a Pro product key and it'll take care of the rest. So we can do something like DISM online get features and see all of the features that are in the operating system and whether they're enabled or disabled. And then if we wanted to add one, we just need to specify that we want to enable it. So enable feature, enable feature, feature name, I think Telnet client is a valid one. So I run that command, the component gets installed in the operating system. Sometimes the component will require a reboot, other times it won't, but as soon as this completes, that component should be installed. Okay, so that operation completed. And now my operating system has a Telnet client in it. So easy enough to do that. We run get features again. We should be able to find the Telnet client in here and it should see, show that it is now enabled. So it is there and enabled. So easy enough to add and remove components. One of the changes in Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 is that you can remove a component and then really remove a component. So if I wanted to, I could say remove Feature, feature name, Telnet server. I always get these command line options wrong, so we do help again. It's disable feature. So I want to disable the feature, not remove it. Oh, and it doesn't like help either. Online, disable feature. Feature name. And then there's a new option called remove. So if I were to just say disable feature feature name, it would turn off the feature, but the files for it would still be present in the operating system. If I take it one step further and say remove, then the feature is gone. And the files for the Telnet server now are no longer present on my operating system. If I tried to add the Telnet server feature, it would fail. I could make it work if I had internet access from this machine. It would go out to the internet, it would find the components necessary, download them from Windows Update and put them back. But for right now, those files aren't present. So if you've ever wondered, well, what is that Windows SXS folder and why is it always so big and it never gets any smaller? Well, it's because unless you issue that remove command, every component for Windows, whether it's installed or not, the files are present there. If you issue this remove command, you can actually get that folder to shrink. So lots of servicing commands that you can use. One that you may be interested in is cleanup image. So you can specify cleanup image to remove extra stuff. So it'll describe what it cleans up somewhat. Basically, you can remove backups from service packs. You can remove old components, old versions of components that have been updated by hotfixes. So 
generally this is the type of thing that you would use as part of a imaging process. So we could say cleanup image, SP superseded, which doesn't really apply in this case. I don't think that's allowed with start component cleanup, so we'll just say start component cleanup. And then there's a new option in Windows 8.1 called reset base, which I talked about earlier in the week if you had been listening there. So cleanup image removes old components. Uh, startup, start component cleanup removes old versions of components and then reset base removes the original version of those components just to make sure that there's only one version of the component in the operating system. That will most likely require a reboot. If there are any new components that needed to be updating, updated, the reboot would actually take care of then deleting the files from those older versions. So not too bad, but there are just so many options inside of DISM that, yeah, we're just scratching the surface on it. There are plenty of other things that you can do with it. Basically, if there's anything you want to do to tweak Windows, look at DISM and figure out is that something DISM can do. DISM is moving more toward PowerShell, so there are some things that you can do using PowerShell commandlets that uh, you could also do using the command line, but there's still a lot more functionality using the DISM command line than there is using PowerShell. Next then, OSCD image, which is a utility that's been around for a long time and has a single purpose, to create ISOs. Who knew there were so many options to create ISOs, though? Because it's another one of these utilities that has dozens or hundreds of command line options. Let me start up a new tools prompt. And from there, I can create an ISO. So OS CD image is in the path. If I do help ISO, we can see the options that are applicable to ISOs. That doesn't look too bad. There aren't too many of those, but then there are multiple help screens. So maybe I want the options related to uh, Joliet ISOs. There are a bunch of those. Maybe I want UDF options. Maybe I want lots of different options are available for me to really customize what this ISO looks like. The simplest case, though, we don't need to specify too many options. We can just specify uh, OSCD image, the source folder that we want to use, so maybe E, sorry, F, source, apps. Get rid of some of this. So I can specify the name of the folder that I want to use as the source. demo apps, and then where do I want to put the resulting ISO? Now it gave me an error saying that I'm using long file names, and I'm using, uh, well, it by default uses all uppercase file names, so I probably want to put in additional options. So I will add a couple of options here. One is uh, minus D to say use lowercase names and minus N to allow use of long file names. So now it's created the ISO. If we do a directory of that folder, we can see the disk image file, the ISO there. One of the new features in Windows 8 and 8.1, also on the server side, is we can right click and mount that. We then see a new drive show up where we can see the contents of the folders that I specified. So it's really convenient, especially when you're dealing with virtual machines, to quickly create an ISO with content that you can then mount inside of the virtual machine and copy data in and out. So lots of things that you can do with that. The other scenario that a lot of people want is, well, I have operating system files. How do I turn that into a bootable install? 
disk. That's certainly doable. It just requires a whole bunch of command line options. So like if you were to create a boot DVD, a boot ISO using config manager or MDT, this is the type of command that they're going to be running. Behind the scenes, they use a OSCD image to create these ISOs too. So it has to specify minus U2 and UDF version 102. It's one of the requirements for Windows 7 and above that the boot CDs need to be UDF format, not ISO 9660. Specify minus M. What's minus M? Oh, ignore the size. So we don't care if it's bigger than a CD or bigger than a DVD. If we're going to use it inside of a virtual machine, that's fine. Make it as big as you want. Minus O. I don't even remember what O is. Oh, eliminate duplicate files. Minus H, include hidden files. W4 just affects the logging, so we want it to log every file that it puts on the CD. Minus Y specifies a boot order file so that some of the boot files get put earlier on the CD because some machines have firmware that will only boot uh, boot files if they're within the first two gigabytes of the, the CD image. So just bizarre things that you need to do to get bootable CDs to work. Then on the boot data, you have to specify the boot sector that should be placed in the ISO file. If you're doing a dual boot CD with legacy BIOS and UEFI boot sectors, you have to create two of them. The type zero boot sector, you specify the uh, etfsboot.com. So this actually specifies that the first boot sector should contain that particular file. And then the second one, which is with an EF tag, contains EFI sys.bin, which is the equivalent for uh, EFI system. Then again, we specify the name of the source folder. So this is just the, f the full Windows 8.1 source files. And then the destination is the ISO to create as a result. So if you have anything that has a copy of Windows on it, you can run a command like that and it will turn, in, turn it into an ISO that's exactly the same as an ISO you would download from the Volume License Service Center. Fairly easy to recreate that. The, kind of the first step in deployment automation that most people try out is, okay, I've got the media, I want to install Windows 8.1. The next step is, well, I'd really like to in, embed an unattend.xml. So they'll copy the media to disk, they'll add the unattend.xml to it, and then turn around and burn a new DVD off of that. It might not work unless they put in all of those options to get the, the media properly set up. But it is doable. So that's OSCD image. Next tool in the list, WDS MCAST. This one is for copying files using multicast. So it's a general purpose command line utility for moving files around in mul using multicast. It runs inside of Windows PE. So the general scenario is you run this to copy a large WIM file from a server down to the client machine so that it can be applied to the machine and booted. You use multicast so that you can send that file over the network once and have it received by lots of computers at the same time. So you su significantly reduce the amount of network traffic by only sending it across the network once. The capabilities in WDS around multicast, WDS would be the back end of this that's servicing these multicast requests. It supports an operation mode called autocast. So as clients connect in to the multicast stream, they can join in at any point in the file as it's being sent across the network. Even in the middle, they'll receive the second half of the file, then WDS knows to loop back around to the beginning and send the first half of the file to fill in the gaps for the clients that came along later. So Maybe it ends up sending the file two or three times just until it can get all the pieces to all the clients, but that's a lot better than sending it hundreds of times. Plus, it's easy. You don't have to worry about synchronizing all the computers and then hitting go at the same time on all of them. They can join in at any point in the process. So MDT and Config Manager use WDS MCAST or the API equivalent to do this. Let me find a client machine here.
So the command that I would want to execute has a few options. I need to specify WDS MCAST, then the name of the server that I want to multicast from, a username that we'll use to log into the server, the name of the namespace on that server. So the namespace is basically just a logical name that corresponds to a directory on the server. We then want to specify that we're going to transfer a file. We want a progress display, so it displays dots on the screen to prove that it's doing something. We want verbose output, and we can specify the name of the source file. So the name of the source file is relative to the location within that file share, and then we specify a local path on where to put it. In this case, I have an ISO in that particular uh, source folder, contoso underscore x86.iso, which I want to write locally. We'll just say tech.ed.iso. We issue that command. It prompts for a password, which we could put on the command line if we wanted to. And then it will begin the multicast process. Oh, not enough space on the target disk. Let me specify a different location. Put it on the D drive. So it'll go through and do a multicast transfer of that. We could then repeat this process on hundreds of additional machines, and they could all receive that file at once. You wouldn't want to do multicast if you're just doing this on one or two or three machines because multicast does have more overhead. It does slow down the, the transfer process as all the clients are acknowledging that they're keeping up with the data. But uh, the benefits really start to happen when you get above, say, 20 or 30 machines that are actively transferring the data at once. So that's not too bad. That'll continue to run there. Next item in the list. Uh, actually, I left one out. Windows System Image Manager. Windows System Image Manager is a GUI for editing unattend.xml files. So if you ever wanted to change settings that are being used to install an operating system, you would run the Windows System Image Manager. For that, you would select a distribution share, which you can also say I want to create a distribution share. Basically, it's just a folder structure that contains a few well-known directories. Uh, it's not typically used by enterprises. It's more of an OEM folder structure, but fortunately, the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit deployment share structure is exactly the same as a distribution share folder structure plus some extra stuff for MDT. So just point it at your MDT deployment chair, and it'll be happy. So that's what we're looking at here. We then have to select an image. And when we select that image, we can choose a, from two different file types. We can choose WIM files, which are the images, or we can uh, select a catalog file. The catalog file is just an offline version of the component list from the image. If we selected an image, a WIM file, it would have to mount that WIM file and then generate this catalog the first time you did it. Using the catalog file avoids that on subsequent requests. So I've already created the catalog file. We can see it here for uh, install Windows 8 Enterprise CLG. We can say that we want to open that. And from here, we can see all of the components that are included in the operating system quite a few of them, and trying to find things in this can always be fun. Next step would be to either create a new answer file or opening an, open an existing one. I would hope you don't create a new one from scratch because it's just very tedious to put in all the necessary sections to do an automated install, but to take one that MDT or Config Manager have generated and modify it, that's not too bad. So if I navigate to my deployment chair, control folder, Windows 8.1, x64, I can open the MDT generated unattend.xml. Yes, it's fine to associate it to the catalog. And then I can make modifications to what's put in by MDT by default. 
So if you wanted to build your own from scratch, that's about the number of entries you would have to add into the unattend to get a silent install of Windows to work. In this case, maybe all I want to do is tweak it. Uh, the good example is, well, I can search for a particular setting, and I happen to know that there's a setting in the OS called F deny something to enable terminal services. I want to be able to remote desktop into the machine. I don't remember what the full thing is called, but F deny is close enough. If I search for it, it can tell me that that's contained in this lo local session manager component, and the full name is F deny TS connections. So basically, if I know what I'm looking for, Maybe I want firewall settings. We can search for it. It'll show us where those settings are, and then we can navigate to that component. So in this case, I could double click on that. It will navigate to it below. It'll show it highlighted there. The highlighting is really hard to see on the screen, but there is a component selected here. Where is it selected? That's the problem with all these scroll bars. I can't actually see the component. There it is. So that's the component. We can right click on that component and it'll tell us where can this component be placed. So in this case, these firewall settings only apply for Windows PE. So it's telling me that these, these settings can only be added into the Windows PE phase of the unattend.xml. Well, those settings are only used inside of a Windows PE set, uh, Windows PE boot image. So if my intention was to turn off the firewall for a full OS, well, I've got the wrong setting. I need to search some more and find those. But the basic process then is I can either choose to add the setting, or if I know specifically where I want to put it, I can drag and drop it into that particular phase and then change the settings appropriate appropriately there. So enable firewall, no, I can turn that off. Do I want to enable the network? Yes, I probably do. Do I want to restart or shut down when Windows PE is done? So there are just some basic settings that you can put in each of the, the components. Figuring out exactly what these settings are, what they do, this tool is really not going to help explain it. All it's going to tell you are what the valid values are. So like if we were to look at Oh, uh, what's a good one? If we look at Ubi, there's a setting here called Protect Your PC. It says the valid values are integers between 1 and 3. So you can put in 1, 2, and 3, but it doesn't tell you what 1, 2, and 3 are. So if you wanted to know what that value really is, you can select that field, hit F1 to bring up the help, and it will navigate you to a page that describes what those values are. So there is a help file that goes through the details. In this case, one means uh, install updates automatically. Two says important updates are installed automatically. Three says no automatic updates at all. So you can do, there are quite a few settings available and you can customize those as much as you want, but generally we would encourage you not to get too carried away with this because generally there are easier ways to configure these settings using group policy, using PowerShell, using BB script, built into MDT, built into Config Manager, so that you don't necessarily need to tweak this uh, unattend.xml quite so much. It's not a bad thing if you never want to modify your unattend. Next item then, USMT. There are two USMT utilities that you'll generally use, scan state to capture user state, load state to restore it. So generally you would want to know what the command line options are there. So you would navigate to the user state migration tool folder and you run scan state slash question mark. Oops, sorry, one more folder to the AMD64 version. And you run it, it comes back with an error message that says, USMT does not support Windows Server operating systems. Well, I understand that, but 
I would really just like to be able to see the help. Nope, in order to see the help, you need to run this on a client OS. Not a big problem, we can switch over to a client OS. And we can do the same thing from there. So we can open up an admin command prompt. And then from my server, run I get the path right. X64. USMT scan state. So if I run slash question mark, it tells me what all the command line options are. Now, just to give you some idea of the types of things that you would want to do with that. You would specify scan state and then the destination for where do you want to put the state. So maybe I'll put it in C colon backslash state. Then specify a bunch of options, things like slash O to say, well, go ahead and overwrite if you, if the folder already exists. Continue on non-fatal errors. Uh, I want to migrate using migapp.xml, which is an XML file that says how to migrate application settings. I want to use migdoc.xml, which says how to migrate anything that looks like a data file. So I can specify options like that. I can specify that I want to use hard links. So instead of copying the data around, I want to just create new links to it makes it a lot faster, which also requires specifying no compress. And then I also need to specify what to do with EFS files, so I'll say EFS hard link. Yeah, hate when that happens. Had to put in that whole long path. Deployment, share, tools. X64, USMT. Undefined or incomplete command line option. Oh, it's not hard links, it's hard link. Script file is not present. So, in this case, I'm specifying migration XML files because they're not in the current folder. I would have to put in the full paths for those. You get the idea. In order to save the typing, I'll just leave those off. It would run through and just migrate the standard Windows settings in that case. It wouldn't migrate any data or any, uh, any documents, but it will go through each user on the system. It will go through the system settings. It'll figure out what it needs to migrate, and then it will write it all into that C colon backslash state folder that I specified. So that would be the part that you would run on the old operating system or on an old computer. Then you would turn around and run load state on the new computer to put all the data back. So not a whole lot to it. Those are the tools that are run using MDT and Config Manager. You generally don't have to worry about them. The only thing that you would typically want to customize are the XML files. Maybe you create your own custom XML files to specify I want to migrate additional data. Maybe you wanted to specify I don't want to migrate application data, so I leave off migapp.xml. So you have some flexibility like that, but generally you don't need to do too much other tweaking of USMT. The last utility then in USMT is the USMT utils. USMT utils has a few different functions. There are a few new functions that were added in USMT 5. The main capabilities that were in there before was an option to remove a state store. So there's an option here, slash RD, and then a store directory. 
when you're using hard links, those hard links are linked to the original files. Because they're linked to the original files, they have the security of the original files. They also could be in use files. So if you try to delete the hard links, you can get a lot of errors because the files have security and are in use. So this uh, USMT utils utility is smart enough to remove the hard links directly without running into those issues. So it's a good way to clean up the, the state store folder if you needed to do that. It also has a verification option. So if you have a compressed USMT store and you want to make sure it's valid, you can run that utility to verify the contents. The big change in USMT 5, which is also present in the 8.1 version, is a new extract command. So maybe you restored user state and uh, the user calls back later and says, well, I think I accidentally deleted a file. Can you get a copy of it back for me? Yeah, as long as you've still got the original state store, you can extract that file back out and copy it back over. It's not too bad for that. Can you do the extract if you've stored the data on a server? You can, but you can't run, I don't think you can run USMT utils on the server. You'd have to run it on a client, map a drive to the server, and then extract it from the, the file on the server. So I've not tried to run USMT utils from the server. I guess we can try that real quick. So if I run USMT utils, Hey, it doesn't generate any errors. So it looks like you could extract it on the server if you wanted to. Okay, next item in the list, Windows PE. So if you were really determined, you could create a Windows PE image yourself. And that is done using batch files. So MDT Config Manager, they've automated this. They've created lots of code to do that. If you want to, you can do it yourself just by running a few batch files. The first one is copy PE, where you run copy PE, then specify the platform that you want to create. So if I wanted a 64-bit image, I could do that. Then I specify where to put it. So let's do temp uh, Madrid. That will build a folder structure and copy all the boot files and the uh, winpe.wim into that folder. So that's the first step. You can then go to that folder and make modifications. So if we look in the media folder, sources folder, there's the boot.wim. So if we wanted to make modifications, we would mount that boot.wim, we would make whatever changes we want, commit those changes, and then run another command, make winpe media. That command specifies, well, what kind of media do you want to create? Do you want to create a, a USB stick? Do you want to create an ISO? Uh, where is your USMT or your Windows PE folder structure? It'll then just put all of that in the right place, make sure that the disks are marked active, whatever it needs to do for the type of media that you've asked it to create. So it'll take care of doing those additional steps. The other utility that's provided is a batch file called set SAN policy. So you can modify the SAN policy in Windows PE. So after you've mounted that WIM file, you can run set SAN policy to change what you as, what Windows PE does with the, the disk drives that aren't uh, fixed disk in the system. So if you've got SCSI disks, you've got SAN drives that are showing up, should they be mounted or not? It's one of those fine details that you would probably worry about if you were doing server deployments. The deployment tools can get thoroughly confused when you try to deploy to a system that suddenly sees 25 different disk drives. Which one's it going to pick to install on? Results are unpredictable. By setting the SAN policy, you can tell it, don't mount all 25 of those. Just mount the physical disk that's inside of the system. So those are the tools that are provided for 
Windows PE, all the rest of the customization is left up to you. So the customization would be done using DISM and also just by copying new files into that boot image. So you would use DISM to add and remove features from the Windows PE boot image and then just copying additional scripts, executables, or anything else you wanted into the boot image. So it doesn't provide a whole lot to you other than building that folder structure and arranging things for you so to make that initial configuration possible, but you have to do the bulk of the work. Windows Performance Toolkit then is changing out of these uh, deployment tools and really into more of a diagnostic tool category. So if we look at a client machine, I have a client computer here where I've installed the Windows Performance Toolkit. Actually, let me just start up a admin command prompt, and navigate to where I've installed that in Windows Kits, 8.1, Assessment and Deployment. I hate when it does that. I think it's up a level. There it is, Windows Performance Toolkit. There are several executables here. The main ones are WPA, the Windows Performance Analyzer, and WPR, the Windows Performance Recorder. The Windows Performance Recorder captures trace information. The Windows Performance Analyzer is a GUI for trying to interpret that. The third utility is XBoot MGR. So if we run XBoot MGR and trace boot, that will reboot the computer. So the whole purpose of that utility is to monitor the boot up process for Windows. So it puts the hooks in place to capture the startup process and tell you everything that happened. What services started, what drivers loaded, what scripts were run, every process that started and ended, the CPU it consumed, the disk I.O. that it generated, the network traffic that happened. All of that is captured as part of the ETW trace capabilities that are built into Windows. That all then gets written out to a file. At the reboot, you log back into the system, the trace is still running in the background, it displays a dialogue saying that it will wait up to 120 seconds for the activity to die down, just because when you log in, that doesn't mean the whole process is done. You may want to continue monitoring until the system settles down. But after that finishes, you're left with a file. That file is then loaded into the Windows Performance Analyzer. So it's very easy to do this type of boot trace. It's very easy then to open the trace file in the Windows Performance Analyzer. That's where it gets hard. How do you look at that trace data to figure out what is it telling you? Where are the delays? Why is my boot up process slow? So it does take a significant amount of learning to figure out how to interpret that trace data, but at the very least, you should be able to run these types of traces and then talk to your uh, Microsoft technical account manager or an MCS person or a premier field engineer, someone who does this for a living, to say, I'm having a performance issue, I've captured this trace, the issue happened while the trace was running, now can you tell me why am I getting these delays at boot time? So if I log back in again, we'll see the dialog show up on the desktop, showing that the trace is still running. It'll run for up to two minutes. We can cut it short and say go ahead and finish. It'll stop the trace, tell us where the trace file has been written. And from that point, we can run the Windows Performance Analyzer and open that up. Oops, wrong one. Windows Performance Analyzer.
is the one without the chart icons, even though it's the utility that displays charts. So we'll load that up and then open the file that we just created. Select that boot trace. And it'll show us at a high level the, the information that was contained in the trace. So we have act information about the processes that were run on the system, about the CPU load, the storage activity, so the number of IOs that were generated, and the memory consumption during the startup. If we wanted to drill in, we can just drag the chart into the analysis pane and then begin watching over time what was going on. So we'll see each of the processes start, watch them finish, and then be able to drill down into much more detail. If we see a particular period of time where we think that it's particularly interesting, we can select that range of time and then zoom into just that period of time. So we just keep working our way down to the particular problem that we're experiencing and use that to uh, figure out what's going on. There have been a couple of sessions here this week where they've used this tool and shown examples of how they've used this to troubleshoot problems. One of them is something like, how many cups of coffee does it take to start up Windows? There have been customers who have reported 30 minute, 40 minute startup times on Windows. So obviously they pick up the phone and call Microsoft and say, we've got a problem. These are the tools that they would use to figure out what's going on with group policy processing, what's going on with startup scripts, what's going on with my boot process. So very nice utilities. They're fairly easy to use, but they don't help with the interpretation of the data, just with the processing of the data. Definitely something worth experimenting with, though. The next item, then, is the Windows Assessment Toolkit. The Windows Assessment Toolkit I also have installed on this machine. It is a set of automated assessments that can be run on a machine. So if I run the Windows Assessment Console, there are a variety of different categories of assessments that are available, things from uh, hardware assessments to Internet Explorer to graphic uh, tests, so a variety of tests that get run. Those tests run, they write their results into an XML file, those XML files get consolidated together, and then they can be analyzed and you can drill in further. So we can say maybe we want to run an individual assessment, or we can run a whole suite of assessments. Maybe you want to run a suite of assessments to determine how long a computer's battery actually lasts. That set of tests would go through and exercise the machine with a typical workload and then record the results, which you could then compare between different models of machines, even with different types of batteries or different ages of batteries in them. So you can do a variety of things with that. If we wanted to run an individual assessment, the individual assessments that are available are all listed. Maybe we want to see the Windows UI performance. We have a test that it says runs for about five minutes. Maybe we want to see how well Windows can stream media. So a variety of tests that are available. Maybe we just want to see, well, how fast does Internet Explorer launch? How fast do certain file handling operations run? So you can select what, whatever test you want and then say to run it. It'll load a particular job. It'll give you some information telling you don't mess with the computer while it's running. It might empty your recycle bin. OK, fine. Go ahead and start. So at that point, it just runs in the background. Those tests would continue running. When they're done, it would present the results back and let you drill into it. Lots of assessment tests that are there. You can also create your own assessment tests and hook them into this framework as long as they write out their results either through return codes or by uh, writing out an XML file. This uh, framework is able to collect those results and put them into a central location. 
There is a, a larger version of it then called the Windows Assessment Services. Those Windows Assessment Services are really to have a central server that feeds jobs out to a whole set of machines and then copy all the results back. And they're getting nervous because I'm running over time. That's okay, that is the last one. So let's switch back over to slides and basically just say that is it. Please fill out your evaluations. If you have any other questions about any of these tools, come up front, we can talk about them. Otherwise, thanks for attending. It's been a fun tech ed for me. I am staying in Spain for another couple of weeks to unwind. Thanks.